So um, welcome to the Ranier Ag Agency podcast number two. Uh, we've decided to give it another go. Um, the insights we gave about Amazon in the first past podcast seem to go down quite well on LinkedIn. So this time we're going to try and get an insight into the consumer electronics market in the US. Um, so I hope everyone is doing good. Um, obviously, we're all in lockdown and adapting to our new way of working at the moment. Um, hopefully it's not for too long. Um, there's definitely some stressful moments, um, especially if you've got kids and you're trying to homeschool them. I think everyone understands what I'm talking about. Um, so I'd like to welcome to this podcast uh, my brother from another country. Um, I can't say mother as that's his line. Uh, Mr. Max Borges, CEO and founder of the Max Borges Agency, one of the US's premier Miami-based consumer electronics communications agency. Um, I hope I said that. I hope that I explained that correctly, Max, and it gave that was that was excellent. Thank you, Pietro. <laughs> and, and thanks for having me on. This is great. Great to be here. And always great to see you, buddy. My, my brother from another mother. So, um, Max, a number of years ago, you um, kindly invited me on your podcast, um, Unconventional Genius, uh, where you um, interview a bunch of CEOs, founders, um, just trying to find out what kind of makes them tick. And I kind of wanted to return the favor. And I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, amazed that you can join us today um, on this podcast. It's, um, it's interesting that um, just shows the power of content online these days. But whenever any, anyone comes in for an interview at Ranieri, they always bring up this podcast, even though we recorded it, what, 10 years ago, I think it was now. So um, whatever we awesome. did back then seemed to go down quite well. Yeah, so, well, um, it's, it's, still, it's still getting listens. I, I look at the data, it's still getting listens. People, people lo love listening to that podcast. They, they love listening to what you had to say. So. Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, I, honestly, like, I think it came up again about a month ago where some of, they kind of, they, that, I don't think they even look at the data. It's like we did it yesterday. It's great. So, right. So anyway, I was a lot uh, younger back then. I think I was doing, I think I did a marathon back then. That's how long ago it was. I mean, that was... Yeah, you yeah. were... Uh, you're super fit, though. Though you're super fit now, now that you're a boxer, you know. <laughs> well, I'm one to know, one to know. Yeah, exactly. You you, you got a perfect record. <laughs> yeah. Are, I, are, are are you going to do another match? Well, it was on the plans, yeah. But um, at the moment, the gym shut, so I'm just trying to do some. I've got a bag here in the garage. I'm trying to do some work in the garage, but it's not the same without being in the gym. I mean, we were talking about not working in the office and like the, you know the same energy isn't there at home as you would have in the office. And it's just like being in the gym, you know, especially yeah. in a boxing gym, because you kind of get pushed along by, you know, your coaches and all the other guys in the gym. So, um, yeah, hopefully soon we can get back. Yeah. So, um, I'm sure. Yeah. So thanks for um, coming on the podcast. I mean, I wanted to really sort of invite you in today just because um, on this podcast, we're kind of keen to dig into what's really going on. Um, in the, the kind of CE industry at the moment, um, what the impact of COVID-19 is having on us. Um, I mean, the, one of the reasons why I wanted you here is kind of obviously whatever happens in the US generally has a knock on um, into Europe. And I just thought it would be really insightful for you to answer a few questions just about kind of what's going on from your side, really. Sure. Um, just because I, I imagine, you know, moving forward, we're definitely going to feel some of the effects of that. So, um, so Max, how are you finding business at the moment? And um, are you guys in lockdown like we are here? I mean, is, is the state of play similar? Um, so, you know, we're, yeah, we're all in lockdown. Everybody's working from home. Uh, you know, we're in, uh, I guess the fortunate position is, you know, being in Miami, we've had to be ready for hurricanes. And so my um, IT team has done a spectacular job over the past few years um, putting a plan in place to prepare us to be 100% um, you know, mobile so that uh, if there was a hurricane, we could all work from home. And that plan was completed uh, a few months before, a few months ago. So, uh, you know, when this came up, it really was... Um, was from a technological standpoint, not hard at all for people to just grab their laptops and work from home. Um, you know, people have uh, extra monitors. Um, you know, we've got um, a good program for how to use, uh, you know, Zoom and, and share the various different uh, uh, accounts that we have. And, um, you know, we've got a good, the, the, the management has just done a spectacular job of 
putting um, you know certain cadence and, and rhythm of meetings in place to keep everybody engaged and going and feeling like they're connected, which is always hard to do. Um, so 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 right now, um, yeah, we're definitely in lockdown, but um, but you know we're not letting it affect our business. Yeah. So um, I guess in the U.S., is there quite a lot of areas where when you're saying about being um, prepared for hurricanes, but I guess is this kind of almost like a normal thing being prepared for this kind of lockdown across quite a few states? Well, in in Miami it is, and in, in Florida it is. Uh, you know, I don't know that that's the case in many other places, though, you know, I've heard from others that, you know, they're, you know, people work from home a lot now. And so, so a lot of times people are ready for that. Um, but then again, you know, I've also heard challenges. One of my, uh, one of my team was on a, a small business administration conference call yesterday and uh, apparently it was a complete disaster because um, you know people couldn't hear each other and you know the voice wasn't coming through or the video wasn't working or whatever it was so so even sometimes uh, you know big you know agencies are are having um, government agencies are having you know issues with with tech because they've never used it at the level that they've uh, used it so you know when i heard that i was just all the more proud of of my team but um, uh, I think it, it it just varies on how people you know run their business and at what point they are, you know, in, in their business and if they've you know had the time to get around to putting together a a, a disaster um, plan. So, yeah. I guess one of the limiting factors is probably internet because um, again, I mean, we've never been like for example, my own family here. There's myself. I mean, Lisa, who you know, is working. Um, we've got the two kids just kind of having virtual learning. So everyone's kind of hammering the internet. And I guess that's going on for every single house, you know, in the village at the moment. And I just don't think the internet's ever been put through its paces like this before. So, so yeah, um, that's cool. So um, in the UK at the moment, we've um, obviously got our prime minister, Boris Johnson, who, by the way, has just uh, been tested positive for COVID-19 today. I heard about that. That um, how do you, how do you feel about that? Is that something that's shocking people? Are people no, worried about that? I mean, I mean, the way it's been explained to us is you know obviously COVID nineteen. I think the the people that it's really affecting are the the vulnerable, so like the older you know the sort of plus seventy eighty year olds, people with underlying conditions. And I guess you know hopefully the prime minister is um, you know he's not in one of those car- categories, and I guess he's going to get pretty good medical care. Um, but apparently they're saying it's just got very mild symptoms. So, um, which apparently quite a large percentage of people that do get the virus, they don't even, you know, some don't even notice the symptoms and some it's just very mild and he just seems to be fitting into the very mild category at the moment. So fingers crossed. But um, the reason why I brought him up is in the UK, I mean, he's doing, you know, from a PR point of view, he's doing a great job in kind of, um, you know, explaining what's going on. They've kind of staggered the, you know, the lockdown process. So I think what they've reading between the lines, being a PR person myself, I think they are, they've gradually built up the kind of seriousness of this, you know, through a lot of different stages. So people, the people themselves are actually starting to understand the gravity of not going out, not kind of, you know, doing certain things. And they're kind of almost like starting to self police each other. Um, And I think it's been handled really well. I mean, the way he's been, they've been updating the UK, public every day at five o'clock so there's another one coming up in an hour and a half here and they've kind of pretty much you know taken all the questions from the press you know explained everything that's going on why they're doing it um you know reiterating it's all about the nhs and managing the flow of patients in so certainly from the uk side i mean even kind of all the opposition um in parliament haven't really had much to say either just because it's been kind of handled really well and i just wondered um whether you guys are getting the same um, over in the US. I mean, I know uh, we've been hearing all sorts of things about Trump sort of seems to almost be in denial about what's going on. Apparently, it's all going to be over with by Easter Sunday, which is April the 12th. Um, and I just wanted to get your sort of feedback, really, what you've been sort of hearing. It's, it's been a, it's almost like a soap opera over here when you kind of hear what's, what he's been saying. Yeah, well, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of communication. So uh, Trump and, and Vice President uh, Pence and, and the rest of the team are on TV every day, uh, sometimes twice a day, if not more. Um, so there's, there's just tons of communication about 
what's going on. And, um, you know, our, our news media over here, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, this kind of thing is just insane. It's either hard right or hard left. And, um, and so, you know, you either have the group that absolutely hate Trump or the group that think Trump is, you know, the best president we've ever had. Um, and, and there's no, there seems to be no middle ground whatsoever. Um, so, so it's always kind of a soap opera when it comes to politics here. Um, and, um, you know, it just, I guess it depends, you know, who you ask, but, um, they're, they're just getting ready now to, um, approve a pretty major financial package. I think it might have been approved yet, but there's still detail to be reported. It's, I don't know, two trillion, three trillion dollars. It's it's fairly enormous. And um and you know I'm confident that that's gonna have a, a big impact um you know on the uh on the economy. Um you know over the past few days uh the economy had been ticking back up again today it's down a little bit but over the past three days it'd been going up quite quite a bit. So I think that people are start. It's probably starting to level off um, as far as the economy is concerned, um, and as far as you know how people are behaving out there based on what they're hearing on the news. I think you know most people are hunkered down. You know they're they're staying inside. Um, they're you know people are keeping their distance from each other. They're not getting together. You're not seeing issues with you know I mean businesses that are, that are non-essential are closed down in most cities and. Um, and, and so I think, uh, I think people understand what they need to do to get through this. And is the lockdown, I mean, I guess it's an enforced lockdown. It's, uh, you know, shops are shut apart from, I guess, supermarkets and, um, essentials. Yeah, there's, there's quite, still quite a few things you can do. You can go to the supermarket, you can go to the drugstore, you can, you know, go get gas for your car. You can go to the auto repair store. You can, you know, there's, there's various different things you can pick up food at different restaurants to go um have food delivered uh things like that um <clears throat> i went by my office uh, yesterday just to get out of the house for a little while there were two other employees in the office there's usually 40 in there um so and there were three of us so obviously you know we're very distanced in the <laughs> in the office and and nobody was getting anywhere close to each other so um yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not like the military is out, you know, stopping you if they see you out on the streets. But I think people are doing a really good job of uh, of just staying inside. I mean, the the streets are are I think the only cars on the road are people going to the supermarket or you know delivery drivers. Yeah, that does sound very similar to here. Actually, I mean, uh, the one weird experience I had last night was I I finally ventured out after a few days and went to the supermarket. And I just went to the like a well Tesco's, which is like a local supermarket here in the UK. Right. And um, I got there, and we all got ushered in one way, and they were they were exiting people out another way. But on the way in, they had you know like hand sanitizer, and mm -hmm. things that had to kind of like do their hands before they went in. Everything was um, limited because I don't know here they've been kind of bulk buying, so straight away people were buying toilet paper, pasta. I mean, I haven't seen toilet paper in the shops for about two weeks. So. Yeah, yeah, neither have we, which is which is insane. Now, it's interesting you said that because they're not doing that here at the supermarket. They're at, at the grocery store. They're just doing things the way they've always done it. You just walk in the grocery store. You go anywhere you want. You, you do anything you want. It, it's really not a safe place to go, in my opinion. And the supermarkets are just full of people at all times, I think, because now people are they, they want to get out of the house. And so maybe they didn't, they're probably going to the, to the grocery store more often just as a, a little getaway. And there's just tons of people, um, you know, in there, half of them, maybe a third of them are wearing masks and gloves and yeah. the rest of the people are not wearing anything. And, um, you know, it's, it's probably the number one place right now where, uh, where you can get coronavirus. It is. I mean, I've, <laughs> Yeah, with the, in the UK, I mean, so I, again, I, I can only speak for my own sort of local supermarket, which isn't in a city or anything. And it's, but it's just very strange going in and you can sort of physically see people backing away from you. 
and it's just it's like you know just it just feel, i'm you know i'm a social person and i find it very off-putting to kind of be in that situation so oh yeah oh yeah i'm, I'm, a, I'm a hugger so you know yeah. if i can't uh, if i can't give you a big hug then that's uncomfortable <laughs> they're like this come on what's wrong <laughs> So, so with um, the business support, then, I mean, they will any of that be able to to help you guys out? I mean, in the UK, we've got things like um, there's no VAT being paid, which is like the twenty percent tax. I think we you, you don't have to, it won't be taken from our accounts now for about six months. Um, mm. there's no business rates on certain employees. They're rather than making people redundant if you can't pay them for any reason, they've got this thing called a furlong. So the government will pay up to two and a half thousand pounds a month of their salary. Um, it's all really good stuff. Um, they they put yeah. a, a mortgage holiday in, so your mortgages you won't have to pay for three months. You can just request it from the bank if you've been affected. Um, the only criticism is that um, a lot of this is all these things are in place, but it's it's still not available yet. So it's all been announced, but yeah. You know, businesses like um, I mean, it's okay for we're on retained work and stuff like that, and you know, one month isn't going to kill us. But if you're like a, um, you know, a coffee shop or a sort of small business and you just suddenly like, that's it, your revenue just stops dead. Right. You know, you might not be able to pay your, your employees like straight away. Like you won't, just won't have the money until this thing kicks in. So there's definitely going to be lots of holes in people's income. Because at the moment, like with mortgage windows, I mean, I called up from my own house and um, it's just not available. Or A, you can't get through to the bank because they're so inundated with calls. Right. Be, you know, it's not set up yet. They're trying to figure it out as well. Yeah, we're in exactly the same boat. Tons of different programs that they're talking about and that they're announcing that sound like they're going to be fantastic. But for me as a business owner, it's tough to consider, you know, making decisions based on a program that I'm not even 100% sure I'm going to qualify for. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's some programs where they say they might, you know, help you pay employees um, if you don't fire them. Well, okay, but, the, you know, there's not enough detail yet to, to know. And, uh, you know, my accounting firm is looking into it and they've been sending us, you know, twice daily emails with updates, but they're still not, uh, you know, 100% sure, probably not going to know till next Tuesday, you know, maybe later. And then who knows how long it's going to be for them you know, to get, you know, checks out, but it's a big, it's a big undertaking, you know, to, to, to distribute $2 trillion effectively, you know, is, is not easy to do. Um, I remember losing my luggage once on the way to Rome with my wife and we each got $500 from American Express that we had to spend um, before we found our luggage, if we found our luggage. And, um, and I remember how hard it was to spend the $500 <laughs> just, you know, buying things, you know, everyday things that you needed to, to replace in the bag. So I can't imagine what it's like to, uh, to, to, to distribute, you know, $2 trillion to, to businesses and, and to people effectively, you know, across the country. Yeah, well, I, mean, I guess the, the big hurdle really is just to make sure that people don't, they're not, um, you know, they're being fraudulent. You know, people trying to take advantage of all these grants and, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's that, I'm sure it's going to happen. So, um, of course, of course. And, and that's the big problem, right? It is, is you want to get the money out there quickly, but to do it in a way where people are not going to be fraudulent, um, you've got to have systems and processes in place. Well, you don't have time for these things. You yeah. basically have to hand, you know, the money out and then hope that people are going to be honest, knowing that they can be audited um, retroactively and get in a lot of trouble if they, you know, take money that they shouldn't have taken. Yeah. Yeah. So um, coming back to um, uh, the CE industry then. Um, so at the moment, you know, we found that um, obviously we've been affected in the short term with things like uh, Mobile World Congress being, um, you know, iced and some of the other shows and just sort of short term projects that we would have otherwise um, completed. You know, have you seen any kind of change in your client's behavior in terms of spending at the moment? Are they being more conservative? Are things not being signed off? Have you sort of noticed anything? Um, a little bit, you know, there's some new prospects that have, um, that have delayed making a decision 
uh, to move forward. But, you know, I think a, a lot of, we've got a lot of really great clients and a lot of really smart companies and they know, you know, when, as they say, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And a time like this is actually a phenomenal opportunity to gain market share uh, amongst your competitors because a lot of companies, you know, are, are nervous. And so they're not making aggressive moves forward and they're taking their foot off the gas a little bit. And, and that's an opportunity for you to go in there and get aggressive in your marketing and how you're uh, you know pushing your company forward and gain market share and e even though uh, y your your sales may be flat or your sales may be down um, your competitor is going to be down even more and so when you come back you're just going to be in a much better position against your competitor to make a much better comeback than anybody else and I think a lot of our clients um, understand that I mean I understand that as a as a business because i went through this in 2008 2009 where we really put the pedal to the metal and and grew uh, a little bit not a lot but we grew a little bit and that you know really made a really big difference in our overall um growth trajectory over the years and so you know i look at this time right now as a as really as a as an opportunity because anytime there's change anytime there's there's an opportunity to kind of look at it and go, what can we do different? What can we do better than anybody else? How can we use this to our advantage? And that's the way that I think you have to look at it with that kind of optimism. Yeah. And I suppose the, you know, the, only, the other side of the scales there is, you know, in consumer electronics, I mean, I remember from the last recession, um, 2007, 2008, actually, um, we did quite, the, the, the brands that we were working for still did quite well. Um, because in a recession, people stop buying the big stuff like cars and houses and all that kind of stuff. And then they still spend money, but they spend maybe on smaller items like consumer electronics. Um, but in this situation, I think the brands are, are struggling for slightly different reasons. So, I mean, in the UK, um, there was a whole kind of um, discussion around what was going on with uh, online platforms like Amazon, because Amazon themselves were reallocating shelf space to COVID-19 priority items like hand sanitizer, toilet roll, you know, things that were kind of needed, um, well, or that were selling out because of it. Um, and especially now, now that all the kind of bricks and mortar shops are shut as well. So all the consumer electronics stores are shut. So the only place you can buy is online. I mean, are, you, are, are kind of your brands feeling the same sort of pinch are the other sales channels being restricted or is it just kind of now doubling through online? I mean, is what's going on there yeah again I, I think it's 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 about looking at these challenge uh, looking at the challenge and, and going you know how are we going to make the best of it so um you know you've got to double down in, in those areas that maybe you weren't paying attention to before and and see what opportunities you have to to build the the business and um uh, you know, uh, different businesses obviously are going to be impacted in different ways, depending on how valuable their product is under the current situation, right? So, um, for example, we have a client called Phone Soap who makes a uh, small box that you put your phone in, and then uh, when you close the box, it uses ultraviolet light to um, disinfect and kill all the germs on the phone. Well, they have blown up. Um, they've, they've, they've sold more pro They're completely sold out of product. I think they sold more product in the last few weeks as they did in the previous year and are, are completely on back order and, um, and are getting tons of press and are doing fantastically well. Um, and I'm sure there's, you know, other companies that, that are absolutely taking, uh, taking a hit. So, so yeah, so it, it, it's going to vary from, um, from one company to another, but you know, you've got to be creative and, and you've got to sit back and, and ask yourself, what can we do to be excellent under the circumstance as opposed to what can we do to not go out of business? Okay, that's, that's the defensive way to look at it. And, and certainly you have to look at it that way, but at the same time, you have to look at it and go, how can we make this into a great opportunity for ourselves? Where is you know, the silver lining here and how can we come out of this with a great story about how we turned a negative into a big positive. Yeah, but I think that's just... know, initially a lot of the brands here were, what they were worried about is that their 
you know, I think something, I can't remember what the stats are, but it's like 60% of all consumer electronics products in the UK are sold via Amazon. And suddenly Amazon were restricting their shelf space. So once the kind of product ran out that was already stocked, that was it. They weren't taking any more. I don't I think the reality is there are different ways to sell through Amazon which brands can take advantage of but again some of the brands they weren't set up to use these different ways they didn't you know they weren't aware of what was going on and I think you know it's been a real wake up call I think to brands just in terms of like their sales strategies and kind of to have contingencies I think if you know because I mean you as an agency we would never you know, rely on one client as like with like 60% of our revenue because we knew that would just be an untenable, dangerous position to be in in case you lost the client for whatever reason. But I think there's a lot of consumer electronics brands, certainly up until this point, may have been in that situation with yeah. one sales channel sort of relying on Amazon. I mean, it's great while it kind of, it works, but in a situation like this, suddenly you're really exposed. Yeah. Um, well, and that's a choice that we make as business owners, right? You know, if, if you've got 60% of your business under one client or 60% of your business under one distributor, retailer, sales channel, whatever it is, you know, that's a business choice that you're making and, and you accept the risk with it. And, and if that's not working out for you right now, then um, obviously that's going to, you're going to be better prepared the next time around, Yeah. you know, so, so you know, hopefully it's something that companies will be able to survive um, because next time around, you know, they're going to understand that, you know, when you do something like that, um, you take a risk. I mean, I remember, you know, when I first started my agency and I had, you know, one client, I was terrified because I only had one client. I was just starting. And when I had two, three, four, five clients, I was still terrified because, you know, with five clients, you lose one of them and you might lose 20%, 30%, 40% of your business overnight. So my motivation was always not to grow the individual clients, but to get more clients so that no one client was too much of my business. And so, you know, I, I was, I was always just terrified uh, of that. Yeah. And, and today don't have any clients that are more than five or 6% of our business. And so, um, you know, these are, these are all decisions that we make as, as business people. And, and, you know, sometimes you have to take that risk and, um, and put, you know, all your chips on one, um, you know, number, but, but, um, but I think, uh, you know, again, it, it's, that's, uh, this is what running business is all about, right? It's about choosing your risks and, and making the decisions that are going to be best for you. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. And hopefully they're not so wrong that they put you out of business. I'm pretty sure we talked about this in our original podcast 10 years ago, but it's, it's calculated risk. It's, you know, if yeah. you've got an over-reliance on one brand or one customer, you know, you just need to make sure you're using it as a stepping stone to get to where you want to be. You can't rely on that business moving forward. And I think certainly a lot of young consumer electronics brands that may have been caught out in the last month or so, you know, this is a learning curve for them. And if they come out of it the other side, you know, they now know what, how to reorganize their model moving forward. Um, I mean, one, uh, Warren pointed out to me in my, in the first podcast um, about Amazon and companies that were overly reliant on Amazon, you know, not to forget other um, platforms like eBay, they do exactly the same thing, but a lot of people focus on Amazon because that's where, you know, where the, the media hype is. So, so yeah, cool. Um, my next question really was around um, a lot of shows. I mean, so far this year, we've had Mobile World Congress, E3, GDC. I'm pretty sure EFA is going to be cancelled as well. Brands typically use those shows as a platform to kind of launch a bunch of products um, or to do all of their sort of face-to-face -face meetings. I mean, it's always sort of it's a well-known fact that um you know when you it might be difficult to kind of meet people from brands because everyone's so busy through the year but at the shows on the other side of the world you know they're much more available just because they're there to meet people for three or four days now you know through probably throughout the whole of this year i'm not really sure of any sort of major show that's probably going to really go ahead um maybe even go into ces next year you never know hopefully by then it should be okay but but um i th kind of feel that brands have had an opportunity to rethink how they spend their marketing budget because you know what again what we found certainly at Ranieri is um brands that would typically have spent quite a lot of money at um expos around their stands you know getting people there 
kind of all the kind of costs that get associated with it have suddenly got budget available. They've still got their product launches through the year, but they're having to sort of rethink what they do. Um, and I actually think when we come out of the other side of this, I do worry for, um, you know, exhibition providers, because I wonder if once people have kind of realized that they don't have to spend, you know, half a million dollars on an exhibition stand and can still launch their products in the same way to press, you know, will they continue to kind of spend money in this way or will they actually be a lot more focused on doing like Apple and um, you know, some of the bigger brands for years, they've done their own developer conferences, their own announcements. They completely bypass exhibitions and have done for a long time. Um, you know, is that the way forward for brands these days or do you think the exhibition model will just, you know, pop up just like it always has? You know, that's a great question. And it's something that, I had thought about years ago when, you know, video conferencing started to, um, you know, come out and, um, and, and I just thought, wow, with video conferencing and the internet, why do you even need a trade show? I, I mean, what's, you can see everything, you can communicate, you know, effectively, just like you and I are communicating right now. It's, it's, this is almost as good as, you know, talking face to face. And, um, and I was I was shocked, that, you know, to see shows like CES continue to grow and grow and grow. I think something like this happening, and we'll see if this impacts CES. I, I doubt it's going to, um, you know, still still be an issue by the time CES comes around in January. But um, but I think it it's going to force it's forcing people to use video conferencing more effectively. I think people don't use video conferencing enough now a lot of times people still email each other or maybe they'll call each other but they're not video calling each other enough and making that contact which is one of the real values i think in the trade shows is having the the face-to-face -face contact yeah. but you can get that through video conferencing um it's just that people don't use it for whatever reason i don't know if they're you know they're afraid they're gonna buy it's just kind of this maybe this, this wall that exists where you don't know if the person is busy, you don't know if that person wants to talk to you, where if you're at a trade show and you see somebody standing there, it's a lot easier to just to walk up to them, um, especially if you know them and to say hi to them or to set a meeting to talk to them. But I think that um, this is probably going to just move that forward more quickly, just this idea of people using video conference to communicate more often um, and and more effectively, will it replace the trade show? I don't know. I mean, people still like, you know, meeting people in person and and touching and feeling products and and uh, and and having you know that kind of experience. But um, so, I, if I had to guess, I would say that it's probably not going to have a huge long-term impact on trade shows, but it probably will have a positive impact on how well and how effectively people are using video conferencing to communicate. I mean, one thing over the past sort of, I don't know, maybe five years now, I mean, I, th I think trade shows have been, they're always a, a great kind of epicenter for people to kind of meet, you know, all across the world and everyone to kind of be focused on a particular event. Um, but already I've seen, you know, I spend my, well, probably you're the same, but, you know, meetings at places like CES tend to be more in hotel suites than they do at the conference themselves. And I just wonder if maybe that will kind of, you know, increase more where people won't get this enormous stand anymore. They'll kind of become, the suites will become a bit more lavish and, you know, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to put my stake in the stands here and say, look, I think that shows you know, will have a knock on effect from this because I think people will sort of wake up to the fact that maybe they can actually be more productive with their budget with hitting their customers than spending, you know, half a million dollars on a stand where they'll probably, I mean, when you have that stand for the whole week, you may, I don't know, you probably get two or three really good meetings which end up in proper customers with proper, who are proper POs. I mean, yep. was, you know, would you have been able to find those brands otherwise? Probably. But. Yeah. Could you have spent that half a million dollars hiring three or four or five really good business development people? Yeah. And would they have accomplished more in a year than you did at that trade show? Yeah. Um, you know, and you're only looking at the cost of, 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 of 
being at the trade show, but you know, what about all of the attention that gets put on that trade show and that gets ta gets taken away from other activities? So, um, yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that that trade shows have a lot of costs and a lot of hidden costs that if they were redirected toward other activities um, might, in some cases, get you a better outcome. I, I'm sure it varies. And, and and look, there's some things that you can't replace, you know, that serendipitous opportunity to meet people when yeah. you're walking around, when you're, you know, at a party, when you're at an event, when you're standing next to, if I'm standing next to you and you introduce me to somebody who you know that I don't know, you know, those kinds of things don't happen when you're doing a video conference. But um, but they could happen if you're proactive enough about, you know, asking for those introductions and following through with them. People are just not that aggressive and that comfortable with with that, so so they don't do it as much. But I I I, I do think that there's some irreplaceable value that comes from being at trade shows. But you know, what dollar value you can put on that is, you know, it's a big question mark. Yeah, 100%, 100%. 100%. So. Um... I've noticed that a lot of things have gone online already. I mean, a lot of brands are kind of taking advantage of things like streaming and webcasting and stuff. Have you, um, I mean, there was one in particular I watched uh, last week, I think, which, you know, I think for our industry, there's definitely a massive opportunity to kind of, you know, be creative and get these things more interesting because, you know, I don't want to see, you know, a man stand on a stage in front of a green screen for 45 minutes which is kind of, you know, reenacting a live event. I mean, actually, you know, I was saying, why not get, um, you know, if you're launching like a music product, you know, get a hologram of Jim Dawes to do the, uh, you know, to do the presentation, Jim Morrison the, from the Dawes, not Jim Dawes, um, you know, get him to do the presentation on the stage or just do it in a kind of, you know, fun, you know, cool way, you know, when it's virtual, you've got, you can do all sorts of stuff, you know, you can have the guy presenting on top of a mountain, you know, rather than just that kind of, backdrop i mean have you have you seen anyone sort of taking advantage of any of this technology yet or um you know i i haven't been on social media much these past this past week or so um so i haven't seen a whole lot i've seen some some artists do some you know free virtual concerts um, the guy from Coldplay did like a virtual concert from his home, he took requests and everything. That was kind of cool, but um, but I haven't haven't seen a lot. But I think there's a huge huge opportunity, um, you know, for that for that kind of content to be developed and that kind of you know real time uh, live type of content to be uh, to be put out there. Yeah, definitely. So. Um... How are your, um, I mean, one of the concerns I've got here in the UK, and I, we touched on this before the call, is um, just kind of employees and working at home and their general kind of mental state. Um, I mean, I know when I kind of first set up Ranieri, I mean, one of the reasons why Ranieri even exists um, is because I went freelance um, very early on <clears throat> and I ended up, I just couldn't work at home on my own. I just absolutely detested it and to the point where I felt I was becoming unhealthy. And I eventually just got myself a little office so I could get up in the morning, get dressed, you know, go to an office, go to a place of work and have, you know, some separation between work and home. Because right. I think once you work at home for a while, it's very easy just to kind of sit in front of your laptop. Um, you know, eventually you start to forget time, you start to, you know, meals start to, you know, become, you know, all times of the day, you get out of your sort of normal exercise routine and it's really unhealthy. And I think you know, mentally, it's not a great sort of situation to be in. And I just wondered if, um, you know, are you going to be trying to do anything with your employees to keep them healthy? Or is there, have you had any concerns that you're worried about? Um, yeah, I have a lot of concerns because, uh, you know, though for some employees, I mean, look, if you're a single person living at home, that's tough because then you're alone all the time. And that can really wear on you. If you're a married person and you have children, that's a huge challenge because now your kids are not at school and you have to take care of your kids while you work. And that's not easy to do. So people who don't have help um, and who, who both the husband and, and wife or, you know, both partners work, it's, it's very, very difficult. Now, if one of the 
uh, partners has lost their job, then that's stressful too. So there's stress coming from so many different angles. It, it's, it's, I, I think there's probably very few situations where um, working from home is working perfectly. I think that, um, you know, just the fact that we have a few people coming into the office um, just to kind of get out of the house um, shows that, you know, people do like to, you know, get away. You know, not everybody's home is set up, you know, optimally, you know, where they have room for a home office or they have some separation or they have a quiet place or things like that. So it, it's a lot of stress. I mean, I know with some of my employees where the husband and wife are, are both working and they have kids, you know, they're taking turns taking care of their kids and kind of, you know, working for a few hours and then taking care of the kids and then working for a few hours and taking care of the kids. But what that means is that their work day is being stretched into like a 16 hour work day to get eight hours of work in because half of the time they're taking care of the kids and half of the time they're working and the other, the other partners doing the same thing. And so, so now, you know, they're working a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the afternoon, a couple hours in the evening, and a couple hours late at night. It's like the day never ends. And there's never any time where they're both free to just chill out and, you know, watch some Netflix together. So it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's really, really, really tough. And, um, and I'm, I'm really proud of, I, I, under those circumstances, um, my folks are doing an amazing job. I got to say, I was, I was nervous when we were first talking about um, letting everybody work from home and how that was going to work. But um, even with all that stress and all those challenges, um, you know, everybody on the team is doing a spectacular job. They understand how important it is for us to, um, you know, keep pushing forward as hard as we can. As I like to say, the only thing worse than getting the, coronavirus is getting the coronavirus and then losing clients and then having to lay some people off. So, you know, we don't want that to happen. Um, so, so, you know, we, we've got to keep pushing through these tough times so that they don't hit us harder than we want them to. Yeah. I mean, I think as employers, I'm, you know, I definitely feel a sense of responsibility and that it's just, I've just thought of a few ideas that I might, um, because I think one thing I've noticed, like, for example, with, um, you know, IT in the office, you, I, you know, so I'm always staggered sometimes where someone might have a laptop that isn't working properly and their mic's not been working and they don't actually say anything because they're too worried about, you know, becoming, se seeming to be being a difficult person or something. And I just want to make sure that, you know, I speak to all employees, maybe even call them individually and just say, look, you know, have you got everything you need at home? Is there anything we can do to make anything better? Because I mean, you guys are probably way ahead of us because you're prepared for the hurricane season. You've kind yeah. of put stuff in place. Whereas for us, this is a completely, you know, no one in the UK is prepared for this because this has never happened before. You know, people are used to working at home, but working at home from our point of view means just taking your laptop home and working from home for the day. You know, all our stuff is in the cloud, but when you're working for weeks on end in an environment where, you know, you haven't got a big screen, you know, like a keyboard and a mouse and all that kind of stuff, you know, it's, it becomes difficult. So it's very, it's funny what you said about the kids and uh, family and stuff. Again, I'm, again, I'm lucky here where I've got, you know, my wife and my two kids here and I'm actually just trying to stay positive and just, I'm, I'm sort of seeing it as a look when, a, when, in the next 20 years, am I going to get to spend, you know, two months with my kids? Right. You know, normally I'm not here and I see them in the morning and I see them at night. Both times they're grumpy because once they've got up early, <laughs> they don't want to get up and the other end of the day, they don't want to go to bed. So, and that's what I see. Them. That's a great point. That's yeah, a great point. In between, they're, they're quite good fun to be around. So, um, but you know, I was thinking about, you know, people that some of the guys that work for us, you know, they live in London and they're in like a small flat somewhere. I mean, you know, it's a lifestyle choice. It's amazing when you're young and you're in the center of London, but being locked down like this, you know, it's like being in a prison cell, you know, when they're in a sort of tower block and they can't get out and they can't go out to bars and stuff and they can't right. get to their family. You know, they're the guys that I just feel like, man, I don't know, maybe we should just take extra care of and just make sure they've got everything they need. But Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I just, you know, at this point, and, and we do that, of course, you know, I reach out to, 
employees to see, you know, how they're doing. And if they need anything, I think from an IT perspective, like they know that the expectation is that their IT always be 100% on point. And so, so we, we expect them to always expect that. And so, um, you know, everybody's got a headset like this and everybody's got a, you know, a good webcam and everybody's got an extra monitor at home. We supplied everybody in the company with an extra monitor at home. Um, and so, so everybody's got the equipment that they need. And then, you know, our IT team is, you know, reaching out to people on a regular basis and making sure that they have everything they need as well, checking on everything. And, um, so, so I think that all that's working out. I think some of the challenges, you know, I don't know what the solution is, you know, it's because if someone's locked in and, and they, you know, want to get out, there's, there's not a whole lot we can do. Now we are having a company meeting today and we turned it into a happy hour meeting. So we're, we're going to be doing a zoom meeting. There'll probably be more than 40 people on it. And, uh, and everybody's going to have a, a, a alcoholic beverage, to drink during the meeting. So that'll be late, late in the day today, but, uh, but that'll hopefully be something that'll be, um, you know, fun for everybody and, uh, and give everybody a few minutes of relief. We've got a hard stop at 4.30, which is in 35 minutes. We have exactly the same thing here. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> See the right end of the day. You've still got a few hours to wait. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, so cool. So um, when do you, uh, when do you think um, things might get back to normal? I mean, um, I've been sort of quite, uh, you know, well, not excited is the wrong word, but kind of quite um, happy about the fact, you know, China seems to be getting back on the men now. Apparently production's up to sort of 70%. A lot of the rules are being relaxed. Yeah. Uh, and obviously Italy and Spain here in Europe have had it really bad. Um, but a lot of other countries around the world seem to be controlling it a bit better. And I think the UK is... I mean, it's de everything that we've been doing is all about protecting the NHS here. And I think um, I sort of got some glimpses yesterday from um, the five o'clock presentation that apparently they're definitely ahead of the curve in terms of slowing things down, which is good. Um, but yeah, I mean, when do, do you have any, do you got any feelings when you think this thing might kind of get back to normal? Um, you know, it's hard to say, but the, the one thing I think we have to our advantage in that you know, we weren't the first country to get hit by this is it seems like there's quite a bit of progress being made as far as is treatments and maybe a potential cure um, for this. And, you know, people are not really so worried about getting coronavirus. They're worried about dying from coronavirus or giving it to somebody who could die from coronavirus. And so if, if a treatment can come out that, that can cure people or, or help people get better from this uh, so that they don't die, well, then that's a, a game changer because then people don't have to worry so much about whether or not they get the coronavirus um, because it, it's just going to be, you know, you like getting the flu and you get better and that's the end of it. So, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful. I'm always an optimistic guy. So uh, I'm hopeful that something like that is going to be, um, you know, coming out soon. And, um, and uh, it sounds like a vaccine is still um, a long ways off. But, you know, look, there's so many smart people out there working on this right now, thousands and thousands of smart people. And they don't even know what each other is doing. And so what we don't know is if somebody's really close to being onto something that can make a real difference, that's going to come out, you know, any day now or any week now. And I'm, and I'm hopeful that we're going to have some, some happy surprises that, that are going to be very positive and that are going to, going to, you know, get us out of this more quickly. Will it happen by Easter as uh, Trump has predicted? Um, yeah, I think that's a little bit uh, maybe too optimistic. Um, but, you know, I made, I made a prediction yesterday to my team that by the end of the year that the, that the markets would hit record highs again. And, um, and I think that it probably won't be too long after Easter, you know, weeks versus months um, that things start to level off and, and get back to normal again. Um, 
that would be my prediction. But, you know, what do I know about these things? I think as soon as there is a glimmer of, you know, us coming out of this, those markets are going to rocket because people will just start plowing back in because they know that there all is a, a huge amount of money to be made at the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and people are just, they're, they're looking for the bottom. And um, I think that maybe some people didn't think that the bottom, the bottom might've, might've come, you know, three or four days ago. Um, I don't know how your markets have done in the past few days, but ours came up, you know, quite a bit this week and uh, went down a little bit today. I haven't watched it since we started this call, but it was just down a bit. Um, so yeah, I agree hundred percent. I think as soon as people see the light at the end of the tunnel, that the markets are gonna skyrocket. And because it's not a financial issue, it's, uh, it, it's, it's something that's gonna come back much more quickly. I know that, look, there's a lot of negative people out there in the news. The news loves to paint the worst case scenario. What's the worst thing that could happen? Well, you know, everybody could die, I guess, and the markets could go to zero and, and you know, the world will end. But it, that's unlikely. Um, I think that, um, you know, people are very resilient and they'll, they'll figure it out. And, uh, and things really, as bad as they are, they could be a lot worse. So, you know, we have to count our blessings. And then, yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, business is still happening. It's just, it just feels yep. like there's just a massive kind of bit of limbo going on at the moment. Everyone's like dying to get back to work now. It's just, it's crazy. So, so um, Max, final question, and I, I know you're a busy guy and you've got lots to do. Um, so, have you got, if you're going to give um, some brands a couple of tips right now, what would they be? Well, they would be to one sit back and take a different view of your business. And instead of just looking at it from a defensive, how are we going to save money? How are we going to cut back? I mean, you got to do those things at a time like this, but wh where's the opportunity in this challenge for me to improve my business, to gain market share over competitors and look for those things and try to put those things into action. Um, and, and you know, just kind of bring your, your team together in that kind of positive um, way because, uh, you know, otherwise, um, you know, you're just going to be just like everybody else. And, um, and there's always opportunities within every, you know, negative situation. And, and I think most entre entrepreneurs can understand this this kind of thought process because most entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs because they're optimistic. And, and this is an optimistic way of, of looking at things. And um, you know, you got nothing to lose by, by taking some time to pull your team together and think about, you know, what things that, you know, you can do that, um, that will allow you to, 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 to do the best that you can to, and maybe even thrive in this, you know, challenging situation. I mean, there's definitely a lot of companies out there doing well at the moment as well. Let's not forget that. I mean, of course, I think the laptop guys have all sold out. You were telling me about your client earlier with the self-cleaning case, uh, the case that cleans the phone. Yep. It's kind of, phone soap. Yep. They're doing fantastic. There's lots of guys out there. So there's opportunity. It's just kind of, you know, it's just figuring it out. Um, that's, that's the key thing. So, so yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, Max, it's been a pleasure. I mean, you know, I know we talk a lot anyway, but, you know, just to do it and make our conversations public is amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Pleasure was all mine. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, look, um, stay well and um, my love to everyone over there. And, uh, you too. My love to you and Lisa and the, and the kids and hope to see you guys soon, Pietro. Thanks, Max. Give you a big hug. Yeah. Well, over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy.